Amen. Well, greetings this morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We are glad to see each one who is gathered together here with us. We sang that chorus. We are gathering together unto him. I think about uh, Genesis 49, and I think it may be about verse 10. Uh Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And the term people there really is with reference to, uh, to Israel, but not Israel just as Jews, but Israel as God knows Israel to be, the gathering of the people. Uh, and actually in the Hebrew uh, translation of that is that unto him, unto him, the gathering of the people. And there is no other true gathering. Um, a gathering in a building doesn't qualify. A gathering under a tree doesn't qualify. That kind of gathering, the only true gathering is being gathered together into one, one person, one spirit, one Christ. The only true gathering uh, that God recognizes is the gathering in the designated time and the designated place, designated of the Father from before the foundation of the world, where he hath chosen us in Christ Jesus. Thank God for that gathering. And may each of our gatherings throughout the earth as the church be a manifest reality of that gathering in Christ. So we're just glad to have each of you and you who are with us this morning. Uh, coming to you live through the facilities of Midwest uh, Center for Truth here in Arkansas. And uh, these sessions are a ministry of the CMI Bible Research Center. They are a production of CMI audio and video network system. They're brought to you through Ustream and also can be seen on YouTube. So we're, we're just glad for the opportunity to reach out beyond ourselves uh, to you who are with us on a regular basis, uh, uh, fellowships and individuals and ministers who are with us on a regular basis through, through this particular medium. And we just greet you this morning. And those who may be finding us for the first time uh, in different places uh, around the world, we, uh, we welcome you as well. All right. Um, <clears throat> this coming weekend... This coming weekend, we'll be having meetings in Tazewell, Virginia. Uh, the host of these particular meetings this coming weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday morning of this coming weekend, uh, is the Melodies of Grace Fellowship, pastored by Brother Jim Moore. And uh, we'll be having meetings there, and then beginning on that uh, uh, next Sunday night, we'll be having a, uh, meetings in Boone, North Carolina, Sunday night through Thursday, and then the following Friday, which is October the 31st, we'll begin the uh, uh, Bible conference, CMI Bible conference, uh, in the Lake Lure area in North Carolina, and that Bible conference will be Friday uh, night and all day Saturday and uh, Sunday. So we just invite 
you in those areas of southern Virginia and northern North Carolina, uh, and you who we have folks that will be coming from, Italy, from, from Georgia, from uh, South Carolina, uh, from different places. Uh, maybe uh, you know from the from the East Coast. We're, we're not. We it's open to everyone who can come, and uh, we we'll be glad to see you in in those places. Beginning uh, beginning this coming beginning the 25th Friday the 25th, and those meetings go all the way through November the second in those three different places. Uh, and then following that, I'll be back in Tazewell in November. And I think that's like the 14th and the 15th, uh, 14 and 15, uh, that number's in there somewhere. But it'll be a weekend uh, in the middle of November. I'll be back in Tazewell uh, with the fellowship. There's two fellowships there now. I'll be back there with the fellowship, and that's where uh, Brother and Sister Carr, Pastor, and Brother and Sister Monk are there, and the whole fellowship. Uh, and uh, uh, it is the Gospel Lighthouse Fellowship. And uh, Meet Camp Road, so we'll be back there, and we're looking forward to that later on in November. All right. Uh, we've been dealing with the reality of our burial with Christ. In Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 3 and verse 4 in that area, Paul confronts the believers who were evidently having a problem in living consistently. Uh, I, I don't know the history of all of those problems. It's, it's not even important. But Paul made a statement, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? And he's actually relating that to the law. Shall we continue to live under the law as those who are yet in sin? Shall we continue to live under that system as sinners? And he says, God forbid, how shall we continue to live where we have where we are to, in that to which we are to which we have died and then he says know ye not is there no understanding in you concerning our union with Christ how that he hath delivered us from the power of darkness through translating us into the kingdom of his dear son. And we have come there through the baptism by the Spirit of God. Do you not understand that as many of us as were. So he's talking to the church. We know that. He's talking to those believers. We know that. Who, who have not yet faced the truth of the reality of our union with Christ. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into his death or well were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death therefore being therefore we are we are buried with him by baptism into death 
not only dead but buried. And the reason for that, Paul goes on to say that, and that word that means so that, the reason for that is that we may walk in newness of life, but, but he leaves no doubt about the union of life and what that means. So he says that according in accordance to, according as Christ was raised up out from among the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. How that like as Christ and then he goes on to, then he goes on to say that it is Christ who liveth it is Christ who died once and he dieth no more death hath no more dominion over him and in that he liveth he liveth unto God and then he tells the believers therefore reckon and reckon is a work of the faith of the son of God a reckoning taking place in our soul an acknowledgement of the mystery of God in the face of Jesus Christ, that we are dead under sin, the whole system of it, the whole Adamic creation, and alive unto God, how? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is through Christ living in you. Uh, and we've been looking at the reality of that burial. It is certainly a work of the Spirit of God, a work of the Spirit of God in our heart. Everything of our salvation is a work of the Spirit of God in our heart. A work of the Spirit of God. I just sat down yesterday and made the monthly CD uh, for November. And I was dealing with the power of His appearing. The power of His appearing. The miracle of God the miracle of God the miracle of God which is made manifest through the revealing of his son all of us would have to admit that the new birth is a miracle Jesus said that to Nicodemus that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That certainly is miracle enough to watch a, a new baby born. Whether it is a, a human baby or uh, any of the other animals. It's, 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 a, it's, a, uh, it's a wonderful thing to see birth take place. But they that are born of the flesh are flesh. And while that is, a, is certainly a, a miracle in and of itself, it only is speaking, and that's true all the way back to the beginning, it only is speaking of the greater miracle which is wrought by the Spirit of God when Christ, when Christ, is birthed by the Spirit in our very soul. Born from above. Born of the seed and Spirit of God, which is Christ. Which is Christ. But then, dear friend, on the basis of that, on the foundation of that, because you see, in Him, in Him, 
is every thing of our salvation, everything of our salvation is in Him. The fullness of our salvation is, is in Him. All of the terms that relate to our salvation is in Him. Reconciliation, redemption, sanctification, resurrection, life, glory, all of it the foot is in Him. It's, it's Him. He is that very thing. The gift of God, the salvation of the Lord in the person of the Son, the miracle of it, Christ in you. But He is there in reality. He is there in spirit. He is there in expectation of appearing. Expectation of the glory of God filling the house where he is. Filling the soul where he is. Filling the land where he is. Filling the city where he is. Filling our soul. Filling his body. Doing that believer by believer by believer by believer by believer. As God himself adds such as he will. And it is the power of his appearing is the means by which his fullness takes possession of our soul. It is in the appearing of Christ, the appearing of our salvation. This is a miracle of the Spirit of God. It is a miracle. The eyes of our understanding. Once I was blind, now I see. Once I was deaf, now I hear. But more than that, a new spirit, a new heart, a new understanding, the revealing of the fullness of our salvation, the revealing of the fullness of Christ. Light, light dispelling darkness. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? It is a miracle of God. And as Christ is revealed in us, then he shows himself to be everything that is necessary to our salvation. He shows himself to be that. And he reveals to us our union, the union of our soul with him in that very thing. And it begins with the cross. And it continues. It never gets away from the cross. Not really. Not really. For the cross embodies both his death, a death very necessary, a death set of God, determined of God, and fulfilled in his Son. No man can come to the Father except by me. I am the way, and I am the truth. And I am the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And so it is, 
It is that reality that we come to face. See, it is a work of the Spirit. Paul says that in Romans 6. It's a work of the Spirit, a thing that you are, that you have become by virtue of Christ dwelling in you. But until we face the truth of that judgment, till we face the truth, I am dead. Till we face the reality, we are buried with him. Until we face the truth of the reality, he is raised up and he lives in me. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you. It hasn't got anything to do with setting you free. It's making you free that you may stand fast in the liberty. It is a working of the Spirit of God. And that working, Paul refers to it three distinct times. Once in Colossians, and then again in, 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 in Ephesians, and then again in Philippians. According to his working, which worketh in me mightily. And this is the revealing of Christ. The work of the Spirit of God. The work of the Spirit of God. Beholding as in a glass. 2 Corinthians 3.18 the glory of the Lord, that is, beholding the Lord of glory. This goes back to Isaiah's vision of him. But with Paul, it is more than a vision of him it is an inward revealing of him. The vision of God is Christ himself and he comes into us. He is the vision of God. The revealing of him. The revealing of him is the work of the Spirit of God. Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, we are changed. You see that Tremendous thing in type and shadow in Isaiah chapter 6. A tremendous change takes place. We are changed into that same image. This is the work of the Spirit. The rest of that verse declares that, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And this is the work of the Spirit. Paul goes on to say, a few sentences farther down takes you over into the fourth chapter, but forget that, it's the letter. And he says it this way, For God, who has commanded the light to shine out of darkness, have so shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the one who's in us. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. To reveal the glory that the glory may fill the temple. Fill the soul, fill the purchased, redeemed land. That the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, Hebrews 3 and 1, I believe it is, or maybe it's, anyway, it's in the first part of Hebrews. Hebrews, 
speaking of Christ. Maybe Hebrews 1 and 3. I don't. Declaring that he is the brightness. Christ is the brightness of the very image of God. You look at that and what it means is, in its translation, what it means is, he is the shining forth, the manifest shining forth of the very essence and person of God himself. My Lord, hon, the power of his appearing. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness does that in my heart, Paul says, in our hearts. Those who will, as he's already said, turn to see him. Turn to behold him. He shines forth the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Well, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about knowing him in his death that can only be revealed. I can only understand my union with him in death when he is the light of that understanding. He appears in his glory. And he is the light of that understanding. And it's the same with his burial. So we've been looking at that and I'm reading from a, one of our publications that goes way back when, in, when I was dealing somewhere with knowing Christ in his death, knowing Christ in his burial, and knowing Christ. And remember the emphasis here is knowing Christ. It's not knowing death, it's not knowing burial, and it's not even knowing life. It's knowing Christ in his death. Not some death, his death, his death. And in his burial, not the concept of burial, knowing him in his burial, seeing him in that reality, knowing him in his life, seeing him in that reality. Where do we see him in that reality? Not afar off as with Isaiah. No, no. He is revealed in our soul. In that fullness, in all of that fullness, He is in us. Now it is the pleasure of the Father, and it is the necessity of our soul to be filled with the light of the knowledge of God of our salvation in the face of Jesus Christ to see him as he is. Hallelujah. So we've been looking, I say again, at the time of burial. It is a time of waiting and I want to read this and, and I've made notes in it and so it'll not all just be reading this text but you really won't know when I am and when I'm not and that's not important. Burial is just one view of Christ. Please hear what I am saying now. It is always in view of Christ. It must always be in the face of Jesus Christ. He shows himself. Do you remember in the scripture when he appeared, just appeared in the room with his disciples? 
And Thomas was there at that time. This is after, this is after he peered into the ones in Emmaus and, and all of that. Thomas is there. And he showed him. Look at that. It was Christ himself that Thomas saw. And that's what, that makes all the difference. And he invited him to come. And he showed him his handprints. He showed him his side. And Thomas fell down before him. And cried out, My Lord, and my God. Now, without going into the theology of that, just take that, take that, and bring it right into your soul. That's where he is now. That's where he lives now. That's where he shows himself to be. That's where he is now. Else we're not his body. That's the house he's in now, showing himself to be the salvation of the Lord. Bring it right there. I tell you, we will fall on our face and cry out in our heart, My Lord and my God. Oh yes, hallelujah, every time. Well, the burial, the reality of it, the union that we have with him in his burial, not somebody else's, his burial, is one view of Christ. But it is a distinct view and a necessary view because it is his burial we're not allowed to conjure one up in our own mind it is his burial into which we have been baptized and we need to see it with the it needs to be the truth liberating our soul from that which is buried. It must be His burial that we experience in truth. Not just a period of time in our own life. Not just a circumstance. Not just a time of dryness. But a time revealed in Christ. Not really anything that we can see with our own eyes or understand with our own mind. So it, it cannot be just a circumstance. A valley experience or whatever. No. It must be a time, a reality, Revealed in Christ a realization of union with Him that remains regardless of the circumstances, that remains whether everything is going good or everything is, uh, you know, going south. Or so it would seem. None of that, none of that affects the truth
revealed in our soul because the truth is the truth is the truth is the truth regardless of what we face outward and as long as we're in these earthen vessels we face things outward now come on folks I mean <laughs> sometimes you don't even get out of your house till you face things outwardly you know that as well as I do sometimes these things are critical Sometimes some would call them crucial. Sometimes they're devastating. You understand? Yes. But the truth that has secured our soul in the revelation, in the face of Jesus Christ does not change. It's not affected. It's not it doesn't come out of all of that and it's not changed by any of that. You understand? We don't get realizations of Christ out of that, out of all of these circumstances. Good, bad, big, little. No, no. We don't get a realization of Him out from those things. It is not those things God uses. <laughs> It is His Son He uses. It is the Son who is in us. He has totally and completely used His Son. If I may use that term. It is the Son who is in us. And it is through the revealing of the Son that He secures us in the death of Christ. Oh yes, hon, secures us because he that is dead there is freed from sin, freed from the Adamic, freed from the world, crucified. Oh, come on, darling. He secures us there. But that's not all of it. No. There is the burial. And then, yes, there is the resurrection. But the resurrection is Christ as well but it is not him as dealing with sin or as dealing with the burial of it it is him as the one who liveth And he liveth in you. He becomes the anchor of our soul. The security of our salvation. Well, why not? He is the life. He is the light. In him doth all that fullness dwell. Well, all right. It is a time designated of God in which we come to see, to realize our union with Him. An acknowledgement of that union and a willingness to abide there in Him till he and He alone arises. That He is the arising. That He Himself, are you hearing me? That He Himself is the arising of my soul. That He Himself is the resurrected one of my soul. Burial is a time of waiting. Unfortunately, many believers spend very little time waiting. Waiting before the Lord. Waiting upon the Spirit. Waiting upon the Spirit of the Lord. We seem to be in such a hurry. It's, a, it's, it's, it's very typical. It's very typical. 
So burial is a time of waiting and it depends upon the Holy Spirit working in me and working in you. It depends upon our willingness to allow the work of the Spirit in our heart. And there are many who are just not willing, it seems, to allow the Spirit of God to work a real change in them and burial is a time of change. A time of the renewing of our minds. A time of waiting. Waiting to come forth in the comprehension of newness of life. I've said that truth comes suddenly. The work of the Spirit is a sudden work. The coming of Christ is a sudden work. The times that, that it is said of Him in the scripture uh, and it's quoted in Revelation as him speaking behold I come quickly it means like lightning flash it's not talking about um, it isn't going to be very long till I come that's not what he's really talking about there it is that his coming is in suddenness it is a work of the spirit of God and the work of the Spirit is a sudden work, but it may take a long time bringing us inwardly to such a work. This time of burial may be working in us for years bringing us into a greater realization of Christ. I will tell you everything of the old creation must be dealt with during this time. And hon, don't let me, just by, by saying this, don't think that I'm talking about it's a period of time, a long period of time, a short period of time, and then it's over and done with. No, it is an ever ongoing period of time because it's part of the cycle of life his death his burial his resurrection his death his burial his resurrection it is a cycle of truth it is fulfilled in Christ and it is our knowing him so but it is a time I'll explain that just listen as I go on I will tell you everything of the old will be dealt with during this time. Your identity, your nationality, your concept of God, and those are just surface things. Everything will be dealt with in the light of the truth as it is in Christ. And it is a tremendously important time and you don't want to rush through it. And I'm not talking there necessarily about rushing through time as we know it to be. But allow the Spirit of God to work in you until His time is made full. And who is the fullness of that time? It is Christ Himself. Wait there until Christ appears you know that's a tremendous thing to them that look for him he shall appear Paul says and he said and you, you know where he talks about that uh, uh, they're, they're in Hebrews and but throughout his epistle but the word look there means waiting in patience Waiting in patience. It becomes the occupation of our soul. Now think about that. It must become the occupation of our soul to wait upon the Lord. The Lord himself inwardly, God our Father, will determine in what view we are waiting. It's, it's whatever view of his Son he reveals. You understand that? I can't say, well, now tomorrow I want, I want to see the Lord as joy. 
Well, see, the Lord is joy, the Father's the father it's the father's prerogative to reveal him as he is according not only to the need of my soul and and we're certainly not talking about just the desire or the want of my brain to get out of some situation no the father works according to the need of my soul but more importantly he works according to the desire of his heart which is seeing his son have increase in his land, in the souls that he has redeemed. So it's the Father who will reveal him. Whatever view of Christ is working in our soul, whatever view is working in our soul, learn to abide there until he appears. That's the reason the word patience is used. What is the true end of patience? Well, it's, 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 it's me learning how to, uh, you know, wait a long time. And I, I, I used to know a whole bunch of definitions of patience. I've forgotten them all now because they weren't really good definitions anyway. But the definition of patience in the scripture is that you abide, that you wait until the Lord come. Has great patience for it, James says, unto the coming of the Lord how long shall I wait until he appears blessed be the lamb of the living God well all right working in us everything into a greater realization of Christ everything everything dealt with in the light of the truth. I think for you who search the scripture, uh, and particularly the old scripture, I think this reality of the Lord Jesus is represented in the second chamber of the tabernacle, in the holy place. It is there in type, not only is more time spent in this chamber than in any other chamber, daily, 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 every day, the priests are there, every day, day by day. The priests offer their services in this chamber. So it involves a great deal of time and it involves a great working of the Holy Spirit. Every work of the Holy Spirit revealing Christ is a great work. But it seems, hun, that this reality of burial gets a great deal of resistance in our soul. A great deal of resistance. It seems sometimes, now just let me use words we're all familiar with, we just don't want to bury the dead. So much so that it is not ever again a thought in our heart. Well, you know that that's not just me or you changing your mind. That has to be a, a spirit-wrought condition of my soul. It has to be a renewing of my mind. I don't want to just go on and on and on about this, but, but, I, but I'm made to just 
to just mention that it is the burial with which we have so much trouble. So just let that settle in your heart. Just think about it. Ask the Lord about it. Ask the Lord about it. In John's Gospel 11, we have here a tremendous change. We have here also a time of waiting. It's the story of Lazarus, but it's not really the story of Lazarus, is it? It's the story of Christ, the resurrection and the life. But Lazarus is the, is the man here who, whose death the Lord uses. Lazarus here is a type. He is like a, a forerunner. And, not, and while he is not really the forerunner of the resurrection which, of Christ, he can be seen to be the forerunner of the resurrection which Christ is in me and in you. What are you talking about? I'm saying that, res, that Lazarus is a type of the church, the body of Christ, being raised by Christ himself. And we see that in, in this, we see that in this, in this story. Uh, this whole story is from verse 1 through verse 46, but we'll only be able to look at a few verses, and, and this morning we'll not be able, obviously, to do that because uh, time really gets away. But it starts out in verse 1, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha, uh, all, of this, all of this is tremendously, is tremendously, uh, well, important to setting the scene for what I'm just going to call the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because you know he becomes the center of, where Lazarus was the center, Christ takes that place and there reveals himself. I am the resurrection and the life. But this story involves death and burial and resurrection. All of it is there and Christ is the end and the fulfillment of it all. So he is to you and I, his body, the church. Now I want to get at least that much, that much said. Now, all right. Therefore his sisters went unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now this that we're talking about, his death, his burial, his resurrection, is for the glory of God. 
for the glory of God. And we have to understand that in this whole reality of the cross. It's not just so that the old man can die. Hun, it is so that the new man, Christ himself, can live. The whole of the cross is for the glory of God. The whole dealing of that in our heart is for the glory of God. It's not primarily to get rid of me, are you? It's primarily, it is that the Lord may be seen and that the Lord may come forth in His fullness. What I'm saying, I guess, is this, that the result of the cross, the actual result of the cross is not death. The result of the cross is life. And that's the reality of it. The cross leaves one living, but thank God he lives in me and he lives in you who come there by the work of the cross, by his work, by his work. Except he died and except he went into hell, he was buried. That's his death. And I don't, we don't, that's his burial. Now we haven't gotten to that yet. We're still talking about burying silly little concepts nationality and you know burying race and creed and kind maybe even burying self <laughs> burying ministry allowing these things to be put away out of sight except he died the death that he died except he in his burial except he do that what he did except he undergo that and except he come forth in the power of his resurrection he could not live in my soul and except my soul come to know him in that way, he cannot fill my soul with the increase of himself. That's what I'm trying to say. We must know him. As the truth is in him. And the end of it will be most definitely the doing away with. Oh yes, but the focus of God is not upon that which is no more, but the focus of God is upon the Son who liveth. Oh, hallelujah that he would appear to those who look for him, not, not according to sin, but in fullness of salvation, in fullness of life. But hon, there is the order of the Spirit. His death, his burial, his resurrection that is always working toward that one end. Christ, not only all and in all, revealed all 
and his glory filling all. The burial is one of those realizations. It is the glory of God that we're waiting on, actually, in the time of the burial. We're waiting on the glory of God to be revealed. And who is the glory of God? Well, it is Christ in you. It isn't just Christ. It's Christ in his in his house. It's Christ in his creation, in his city. It's Christ in you. It's Christ in you. And it's Christ revealed in you. See, hon, the glory, he is the glory. He's the glory of God. Put him anywhere you will. He's the glory of God. But the salvation of the Lord is that he is the glory of God in me and in you. The Father's good pleasure, he is the glory of God in me and in you. And in me and in you, when, when is he seen to be the glory of God? When he is revealed. And the Father knows who he is. He's trying to awaken you and I to know who he is. He is. I can't. I, I know I'm fixing that. The time is about to expire. So let me just jump way ahead. Since I use the term awaken. Because that's what we're doing. We're being awakened to truth, to reality. That the judgment of truth. And don't just, don't just connect judgment with death or judgment with burial. Judgment is also connected with resurrection. Oh yes it is, son. Truth works judgment in our soul. For the first time, our soul has discernment and knows the living from among the dead, knows that which is Christ and that which is not Christ. It is according to the anointing truth that worketh in us, awaking us, awakening us. Well, let's just look at these verses and I'll read these verses. It begins with Luke. Luke 9, 32. Just look at this. <laughs> the whole story is the transfiguration, isn't it? Verse 30 says, Behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter... And they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory. Now that's all I'm going to read about that. Because I want this the wonderful sequence here. Now, in Romans. In Romans. Romans 13, 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Ephesians chapter 5. 
Verse 13, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Therefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. We wait in burial. What did he say about Lazarus? <laughs> Lazarus sleepeth. That was his view of it. The disciples couldn't hear it, wouldn't hear it, so he said, look, he's dead. But all the Lord was going to do was awaken him because he belongs to the Lord. The type and the shadow is, it's the house of the Lord here that we're dealing with. It is Martha who comes to him. It is Mary who anoints him. It is the house of the Lord that we're dealing with here. It is in Bethany, very close to Jerusalem. It is there that Christ reveals himself as the resurrection and the life. And that has a profound effect upon the whole household, including Lazarus and including many round bout. All right? But that the greater fulfillment of that. So, Lazarus is a type of the resurrection of the church or the body of Christ. These things saith he, after that he saith to them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. Darling angel, I'm going to stop. What time is it? I'm out of time, I'm sure. Yeah. But, but listen to me. Not only Are we dead to sin by Christ? We're alive to God by Christ. Your resurrection, not the resurrection of you, your resurrection is in you now. Your life is in you now. The revealing of Christ is the being awakened out of our sleep. Because our mind, our soul, you understand what I'm saying? That's what it is. It's not that I have to die, I'm dead. It's not that I have to be buried, I am buried. But I've got to be awakened out of my sleep. That awakening, we'll find out as we look on at this, is the voice of the Lord. Lazarus, wake up. Come forth. Oh, hallelujah. He didn't dig him up. He didn't dig him up. In the reality of this, there's nothing dead dug up. The last day, that that is given to me of God, I will lose nothing. I will raise him up. He will lose none who come by his death, his burial. He lives in them. He is the resurrection. The time of our burial is a work of the Spirit of God. It is a work. It is a working in our heart and in our soul. The end of that is always Christ, the resurrection.
resurrection. But it's an ever ongoing cycle and we've talked about that. It's an ever ongoing cycle. Not all things are dealt with the first time we start to see and realize the burial. Well, not all things are dealt with the first time that you saw I am dead with Christ either. No, much since then has been gathered into that death, no doubt. Much shall be gathered into that burial, just like much of his fullness is gathered into that resurrection. Oh, there's a time in you and I knowing him as the resurrection. We, we still kind of think, well, you know, he made me alive. There's still a cloudiness about it. But more and more is gathered into it and what is gathered into it has nothing to do with me or you or nothing of me. More and more of his fullness is gathered into that resurrection. More and more we're brought to realize my Lord and my God, he is the only life that I have. He and he alone is living in me. More and more of his fullness is gathered in to that reality. But it all comes in the time of his appearing. So may we set our hearts to see him and to wait, to wait with patience. That doesn't mean, well, that means, it, it means what I said it means. Patience. To wait, not till I think I've waited long enough, till I think I've been here long enough. I mean, come on, man, I've been waiting for five years. I've been waiting for 15 years. I've been waiting for six months. I've been waiting. How long has God expect me to wait? Until your soul is in a condition to see Him. You wait until the Lord comes. The Spirit and the Bride says come. Let our hearts join together and say even so come Lord Jesus. Amen. Lord bless. That's it today.